Welcome back. Several Hauteng residents are still reeling following this weekend's seismic activities. They took to social media to describe the tremors that caused structural damage to property in some parts of the province. But some slept through the whole thing. So could we experience another earthquake or perhaps aftershocks? And is it possible to predict the severity? To help us unpack this is Willem Menkes from the Council for Geoscience. Thank you so much, Mr Menkes, for your time uh, this evening. So, so in the wake of Sunday's uh, earthquake, some reports vary. Some saying that this weekend's earthquake measured between 4.4 magnitude and 4.8. Your data says it measured 4.4, which is fairly big, but not big enough to cause serious structural damage. It was felt over a very large geographical area, though, despite being described as a shallow quake. Why do you think that is? Thank you. Thank you. And good evening, Anli. Yes, uh, no, that's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, our information, uh, based on what we've recorded with the uh, South African National uh, Seismograph Network that we have at the Council for Geoscience, uh, did indeed indicate that uh, it's a magnitude 4.4 uh, earthquake that we've uh, determined from uh, from our data. Um, and we, we do generally tend to see, you know, the seismic occurrences uh, in the main, you know, close to the epicenter or the, uh, the point of origin. Uh, communities in those areas typically, you know, experience the, uh, the shock waves or, you know, the surface waves from those seismic events uh, most uh, intensely. Uh, but then, you know, based on the geological extent and the, uh, the materials through which these uh, seismic waves travel, uh, you can also have instances, you know, based on that local site geology where the intensity is sort of amplified and experienced uh, to a greater degree. Uh, and I suspect that's probably what we, uh, what we had been uh, observing with this particular earthquake as well, uh, which have contributed to it being more sort of widely, uh, widely felt as well. I woke up with a shock, uh, one of those people who didn't sleep through the whole thing. Um, and in my experience, it felt like that shaking went on for quite a while. Is that normal? Are, are some uh, earthquakes more intense and short-lived while others, you know, you know, just carry on for a while? What, what did your data say? Yes, that, that's uh, typically what can be expected, I think, uh, especially with the, uh, the earthquake that happened on, on Sunday morning. Um, we generally tend to see, you know, if there are shallower earthquakes uh, of, of relatively larger scale, uh, the, uh, the shaking tends to be a bit more intense or perceived to be more intense. Uh, and that's mainly because of, you know, the, the geological materials and, uh, you know, closer to surface through which these, uh, these waves travel. Generally, when you have, you know, larger events that are deeply seated, you know, people would generally perceive them less. Uh, also, again, depending on the on the site geology. But, you know, we, we uh, also received some reports, you know, that uh, in some areas the, uh, the shaking was uh, felt for at least between 10 and 20 seconds. Uh, and then other areas further away, it lasted quite, you know, a bit, a bit shorter than that. Uh, however, you know, based on the information that we do have, we cannot exactly determine how long the shaking lasted for, uh, but we could actually uh, determine the, uh, the epicentral location uh, as well as the time, time of occurrence and, and its size. So when we spoke to you um, on Sunday morning, you said that there was a possibility that aftershocks or tremors uh, could occur in the days following. Mm -hmm. Has anything of that nature been recorded since the quake uh, early on Sunday morning that perhaps, you know, ordinary South Africans wouldn't be attuned to and we wouldn't have necessarily felt? Mm -hmm. Yes, so at this point in time, we, uh, through our uh, national seismograph networks, we are constantly monitoring uh, on a 24-7 basis. Uh, so those systems are up and running uh, to detect the occurrences of earthquakes. So up until this point in time, we haven't uh, recorded any um, seismic events that seem to be associated with the main event. Uh, however, we also do know uh, there are instances where these uh, typical aftershocks or subsequent seismic events uh, can happen within the weeks or months even after, uh, you know, the, the main uh, event occurred. Uh, but we've also observed, you know, based on uh, prior occurrences that these events tend to be smaller than the main event. 
Um, so that's typically, you know, uh, less than the 4.4 that we act, at least anticipate at this point, you know, should there be any aftershocks from this, uh, from this earthquake. Okay, so, so because we haven't experienced them yet does not necessarily mean that they won't happen. Um, I, I want to take a moment and look sort of at, at counting in South Africa's history where earthquakes uh, mm. are concerned. So two earthquakes measuring higher than five on the, on the Richter or magnitude scale have occurred in counting mm. in recent history. Um, a magnitude 5.4 uh, struck 140 kilometers south of Soweto on August the 5th, 2014, and an earthquake with a 5.2 magnitude occurred eight kilometers south of Stillfontein in the northwest on the 3rd of April, mm. 2017. And then, you know, just from a cursory search on Google, I could find a couple of reports of a handful of other quakes measuring between 3.1 and 4 magnitude, and one as far back as 1969 that was 6.3. Um, but one site uh, reported as many as 12 earthquakes in the past 365 days alone. So perhaps you can give us an accurate portrayal of how much seismic activity we generally mm. experience in South Africa and the wider South, uh, in, in, in Gauteng. Yes, no, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, and I think comparat uh, comparatively you know, to global standards in terms of you know, seismically active areas. Uh, we are definitely not, uh, you know, comparable to other parts of the world, uh, you know, such as uh, Japan, you know, Syria, Turkey, those areas that are hit with, uh, you know, earthquake or seismic events much more frequently. Uh, but in South Africa, we actually, you know, do record and pick up uh, seismic activity and earthquakes on a daily basis. You know, they happen all the time. Uh, but a lot of them are actually what we call uh, micro seismicity. So, you know, generally people wouldn't perceive them or feel them in the same way that, uh, that the one was uh, uh, typically on Sunday. Um, but you are, you are quite right to say, you know, we do have seismic activity also in our past that was uh, quite large, uh, especially the, uh, the Sierra Stolbach one, I, I suppose, that you've been referring to as well. Uh, and then, you know, those ones in the, in the Kosh region, uh, Orkney and, and so forth. Uh, but, you know, these larger seismic events tend to be less frequent than the, uh, you know, typical uh, rest of the seismicity in South Africa, which is generally in the main, you know, between magnitudes one uh, to about three in, in the main. Uh, so a lot of them, you know, generally people wouldn't necessarily perceive them as acutely as the one uh, that we felt on Sunday. The most seismic activity in South Africa seems to be experienced in areas with deep mines. Perhaps that's just a perception because we know that there is a correlation. But does that mean that most of the earthquakes in South Africa are caused by deep underground mining? Um, that's, that's not necessarily the case. And I think maybe one of the uh, matters that might contribute to that is, you know, if you look at sort of our developed areas in the country, you know, generally around the gold mining regions, there's a lot of development in those places. There's a lot of people living there, you know, that would feel uh, seismic occurrences when they happen. Uh, but we do know there's uh, um, aspects of mining activity that can contribute towards seismic activity. Uh, however, in South Africa as a country, you know, uh, even being on a, uh, a intraplate seismic setting that we that we talk of, which is uh, sort of less active uh, compared to some of the other parts of the world, uh, we do have uh, a lot of natural occurring seismicity uh, in the country as well. Uh, and these are typically you know, related to regional uh, changes in the earth. Uh, and the earth tends to want to, you know, somehow come to balance. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and usually that's in the form of, of earthquakes or seismic events. In this instance, uh, after the earthquake on Sunday morning, uh, the Council for Geoscience is investigating whether mining activity or perhaps fluctuations in groundwater levels caused the quake. What do those investigations entail and how long do you think before we have a definitive answer? So at this point in time, we, we usually look at the data that we have, you know, through multiple prisms. Uh, some of them are what we call sort of qualitative uh, studies in nature. And those are, you know, usually undertaken through uh, uh, surveys and questionnaires with the general public to try and understand, you know, how they perceive the earthquakes, how widely it was felt. Uh, and that gives us some clues in terms of, you know, how these uh, uh, seismic waves sort of propagated and moved, uh, you know, through through the through the region. Uh, but then, on a on a um, more of a uh, qualitative uh, scientific basis, 
Uh, we also look at the actual data that was recorded by this seismic event uh, and then cross correlate that with you know the geological and geoscientific information that we do have in this area. Uh, so it's difficult to say at this point in time, you know, depending on the complexity of the nature of the specific earthquake uh, and, you know, the geological setting in which it happens, uh, we might need to, uh, you know, maybe uh, undertake additional uh, investigations. Uh, but at this point in time, we can say, you know, that we are working on that to try and identify, you know, what could have been the most probable causes of this uh, seismic event, you know, uh, whether it being uh, due to historical mining and these water level fluctuations in that old mine workings, or if it is, could, uh, you know, it could just as well possibly be uh, due to natural uh, seismicity uh, occurrences in that region as well. Uh, so at this point in time, we are uh, assessing and, you know, uh, evaluating the data that we do have uh, at hand. So when you talk about groundwater being related to seismic activity, is it exactly that, as simply as you've just explained it, uh, groundwater within mining shafts fluctuating and that causing some disturbance? Yes, so... so Typically, when you have um, uh, earthquakes happening, uh, they, they happen on what we call, uh, in geological terms, terms, faults or fractures. So that's basically weak zones uh, in the rock mass. Uh, and, you know, that's purely because of that energy wants to, you know, follow the um, path of least resistance, so to speak. Uh, so, so typically, where you have groundwater levels fluctuating, uh, they tend to almost like uh, sort of lubricate these structures and it's got a tendency, you know, to sort of uh, move a little bit easier uh, uh, in, in instances like that uh, under the right uh, conducive environments and stress buildups and things like that as well. So those are, you know, typically associated with groundwater levels in the mine workings. Uh, some of them are the natural groundwater levels as well that could fluctuate. Uh, so it's not necessarily to say that it is definitely associated only with the mining component. It could be uh, natural water level uh, fluctuations as well. Okay. Bearing in mind the severe infrastructure decay that we're experiencing in South Africa currently, is there cause for concern that we're vulnerable to serious damage from future earthquakes, whether they're, you know, high in magnitude or not, simply because the basics of our infrastructure maintenance is not being done properly? And I'm not necessarily just talking about um, high-rise buildings, but I'm talking about underwater, I mean, underground uh, uh, water pipes, um, foundations of buildings, roads, that kind of thing. Um, I think one of the um, important things to take into consideration as well is uh, when infrastructure is designed and developed, uh, it's, it's done so, you know, from an engineering perspective with a, a specific lifetime uh, in mind. Uh, and also, you know, if you uh, pair that up with, uh, for instance, the science of seismology and, you know, the uh, continued learnings that we are gaining uh, in terms of the research that we do do, uh, these things all have to be taken into consideration, uh, at least in as far as uh, my knowledge is at the moment, you know, the recent uh, seismic activities that we did experience uh, didn't affect any large scale, you know, infrastructural damage, you know, so I'm talking about uh, civil infrastructure, you know, roads, bridges, uh, pipelines uh, and things like that. Uh, but certainly, you know, as we go forward uh, in terms of, you know, this new information that we get and in refining our understanding of seismicity and, and the effects thereof on, on infrastructure, uh, we do update those uh, models that, that, you know, again, feed into the guidelines uh, so that we really take, you know, the uh, most recent, you know, uh, seismic activities and, and our understanding thereof uh, into account when, when developing new infrastructure. Thank you so much uh, for all that thorough information. It really is uh, valuable to understand exactly what happened at 2.38 on Sunday morning. I think it puts a lot of people's minds at ease knowing uh, that the situation is well at hand and that people are researching to find out exactly uh, what caused it and what we can expect in the future. Thanks so much. Uh, that was Willem Menkes from the Council for Geoscience giving us some insights into Sunday's seismic activity.